Hello everyone and welcome to the 28th in our ongoing series of lectures on Middle Egyptian hieroglyphics. Today we are going to be doing some analysis of the story of the shipwrecked sailor, choosing of course a different part than the last time that we covered this topic. First of all though, I have a very exciting announcement. I am officially partnering with the Save Ancient Studies Alliance. So for those of you who do not know, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance is a collection of scholars, uh, both like affiliated professors of universities and independent scholars, and just general lovers of the ancient world. Their mission is to reverse the downward trend in the study of the ancient world through outreach programs, through community programs, through just generally generating interest and scholarship uh, from the, you know, the high academic level down to especially the most publicly accessible end. They do work encouraging uh, the development of modules for middle and high schoolers to use media about the ancient world to learn about humanity's past. They coordinate live streams. They do a lot of work just promoting scholarship and especially publicly accessible scholarship about the whole of the ancient world. And as you may guess from the nature of this channel, I am a big fan of their work. I love spreading knowledge about the ancient world. That is why this channel exists. So I am very happy to be officially working with them. Specifically, I am part of something called Port Ancient. Port Ancient is a basically a collection of different content creators and channels, especially those on like the smaller end, such as this one, that are creating good and positive educational content about the ancient world. Uh, if you want to learn more about any other topics in the study of the ancient world, I highly recommend checking out their website and especially Port Ancient so you can see what is on there. I imagine that if you are watching this channel, you are the kind of person who just loves spending their spare time learning more about history. I know that I personally do. You know, when I am not reading history books for work, I am listening to history podcasts on my walk home. It is hard for me to get away from it. I imagine it is for you too. And if you are looking for more content that will do that, please check out the Save Ancient Studies Alliance and Port Ancient and all of the great, great work that they are doing. Now we can get on to our main topic. We are going to be looking at Shipwreck Sailor again, but we are going to be looking at it in a somewhat different way than we did previously. Before, we just went through the text for the grammatical content, which is a very good way of looking at a text, uh, especially when you are learning a new language. But I don't just want to do that here. In fact, I don't want to do very much of that at all. We're going to go through a section of the Shipwreck Sailor. This is the section that is in Chapter 10. Uh, and we're going to look at the hieroglyphs and the transliteration and the translation. But I am not going to break down how I got there in most cases. I may make a few comments on why I made particular translational choices, but I am not going to go into a ton of detail about each individual word and structure. If you want to get that, what I'd recommend doing is you could follow along if you're using your textbook. If you do not have a textbook and you just want to pause before I click through the slides and reveal what the answer is, feel free to do that. Uh, I might recommend that if you, you know, you see a, a sentence and you can't immediately figure out what, not necessarily the meaning, some of the meanings will be a little weird, but the structures that are built into those sentences, then yes, do feel free to pause and try and figure it out for yourself, but that's not the ultimate point of this video. We are instead going to be reading through it and then looking at some of the, you know, low level. This is not the, the, the world's deepest dive into Egyptian literature, but so the, what, what's going on uh, in the text at a level above just the bare events, the narrative, in order to better understand it as a piece of literature, and in order to enable you to then do this on any other piece of Egyptian literature that you might be working on. If, for example, you were in a class or even just working on your own and you were looking at the West Car Papyrus or the conversation between a man and his ba or anything else, this will help you at least a little bit understand what kinds of literary devices the Egyptians used and why and how you can apply them to further texts. So let's get started. To remind you where we are from the story so far, 
Our sailor is returning home from a long journey. And to tear up the ship's captain, who is very worried about the results of his expedition, he tells a story of something that happened to him. He had once been on an expedition, the brave crew, and a great ship, but they met a terrible fate in a shipwreck. He was the only survivor. He found himself on an island full of food, he gathered up everything he could and put it into his arms. Then, Aha en Sasai en i we. That second I, or that first I is not written. I've supplied it in parentheses. Uh, the scribe omitted it because it was relatively obvious. Then I satisfied myself. The we makes it clear the only thing that he could satisfy is himself. D N E er ta n where her awi. I placed, in this case, I think in English you kind of have to supply some, like some of the stuff that he had, the food, uh, on the ground because of the abundance that was in my arms. Uh, there is some discussion in the textbook over whether where is supposed to be an adjective modifying a missing word like food or vegetables, or whether it's just to be taken a noun as a noun itself, meaning excess or abundance. I kind of like the latter reading. I like the idea that it's just the greatness in my arms. It's too heavy for him to carry all the food he found. He has to put it on the ground. Shedit i jai. That sick there is because I have some slightly mixed feelings about the T. Uh, also, that character, there's a typo. It should be the arm, not the seated man hieroglyph in the Shadit. Yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about the T's correctness grammatically. I carved out a fire stick. Um, and then what he does with the fire stick is Sehapar N E Het. Now, I've chosen to translate this as a second tense. Hoke says that this is possible. It could also be just a regular continuative sejim nf following the aha and sejim nf pattern. Both of these are very possible. I like the idea of two simultaneous actions. Remember, if you have a second tense and another second tense, it's a just as, then. So this is just as I made a fire. Ir ne seb ni sejet. And Necheru. Then I made a burnt offering to the gods. Seb ni sejet means burnt offering. It is a stock phrase uh, that is, you just have to know the idiom uh, or else you're not going to be able to find it. Dictionary should tell you that you that it is an idiom. I know that Hoke does. Aha en sejemini haru keri. Then I heard a thunderous sound. Here, you can see how aha en gets used. I just want to point this out quickly because it's a really good example of how it works. We've clearly reached a new point in the narrative. A discrete thing has happened, which took some time. He made a fire stick, and then he made a fire, and he made a burnt offering to the gods. That's all done. And after that has all finished, aha en, a new narrative sequence begins. Then I heard a thunderous sound. Uh, this is a bit looser, the translation. It's like literal, to say this literally, it would be like a sound like thunder. Um, or it, it perhaps sound like roaring or something like that, uh, even forceful. I like this because it flows a little better poetically, but carry is not an adjective, it is a noun. Uh, it is the, the sound of thunder. Eve kui wau pu and wajwer. I thought, or I supposed, it was a wave of the ocean. Ocean is also a very loose translation here. Perhaps sea is a little better. Uh, the wajwer is probably the Mediterranean Sea, though again that makes it kind of the, the geography of this story is a little bit confused. The general consensus is that the wajwer was the Mediterranean. But other details in the story make it clear that this story is actually taking place on an island in the Red Sea. If it were taking place in a real place, as opposed to a fictional island that obviously does not exist, I would put it on the island of Socotra, 
off the coast of the Arabian Peninsula, which is a real island that is vaguely in the area being described and that does contain all of the you know cool, interesting trade products that the snake will later tell you that he owns. But that's not what's happening. This is a fictional island that does not and never did exist. Hatu Hergemgem. But the trees were breaking. I am supplying the butt here. I, there's nothing in the Egyptian that marks that because, as you remember, Egyptian basically does not have conjunctions. Uh, it especially does not have coordinating conjunctions. There's no way to just link clauses together on equal grounds that requires a word. You don't use a word for it. They don't distinguish and and but. But in the translation, I feel like you have to use but because the point of this is that he thought it was a wave, but he was wrong. It's something on land because the trees were breaking and tahar men men. The earth was shaking. This is a very evocative image. He thinks he's lying there relaxing on the beach after his burnt offering, and he hears something, and he thinks it's a wave, and then there's an earthquake. He's terrified. Of course. Kef eni chari. He uncovers his face. I'm going to talk about later why I think it's really interesting, and actually probably kind of important, that it doesn't say he covers his face. It points out when he uncovered it. I also think that this is another second tense. Just as I uncovered my face, Gemeni Hafau Pu Yof M Eat, I found that it was a serpent that was coming. I'm gonna break down the grammar a little bit here because this one is an interesting sentence. So first of all, it is a reciprocal sentence. It is a sejima nf and a sejim nf nominals second tenses just as i uncovered my face i found it was a serpent the something else is going on at another level the object of gemeni is not serpent it's not hafau it's hafau pu it's the nominal phrase it was a serpent i found that it was a serpent and then the further adverbial phrase modifying it, which is an entire additional clause, U-F-M-E, which is itself another really interesting phrase because it is a U-F plus preposition plus infinitive using the M for the verb of motion. That was coming and is in actively in the act of coming the sentence, or that clause, is in the present, but it's a circumstantial, so it's in the present relative to the finding. He's finding the snake at the same time as the snake is coming, but he found the snake in the past, so the snake was coming in the past. This is a great little sentence. It has a whole bunch of different grammar interactions, and it's also a cool image. Like, he's completely freaked out, he has no idea what's going on, he, he pulls his hands away from his face, and then there is this giant snake that is just materialized, and he's terrified. Nisu Mech 30, of 45 feet, 30 cubits. Uh, this, yeah, Nisu belonging to it was 35 feet, or 30 cubits. Um, a cubit, by the way, is a foot and a half. Uh, it is the length from the tip of your middle finger to your middle of your elbow. Uh, I am a man of just barely above average height, which means that my cubit is 18 inches, which is also the standard ancient cubit. Uh, your personal cubit may be somewhat different, and that the Egyptian cubit used formally like this is just a, like, it's 18 inches, and it's always just a little bit more than 18 inches. So I just say it's a foot and a half because I think it's more comprehensible um, to say the number of feet rather than the number of cubits. Um, working in meters, it's kind of the other way. That's two cubits to a meter, give or take a little bit. So it's about 15 meters long, the snake. Either way, it's huge. Chebsut f where s er mech 2. 
His beard was three feet long, or a full meter long. It was a huge beard. This snake has rem remarkably great proportions. How F. Sekru M. Nebo. Yes, the hieroglyphic writing here has the circle H. That's a typo by the ancient scribe. This was a learning text. It was probably transcribed, the copy we have, by a scribe who may not have been totally 100% done learning. He might have been like the Egyptian scribal equivalent of like somebody finishing up high school but not quite done yet, not fully certified in the scribal tradition. And he makes a few errors like that one. His flesh was overlain in gold. Uh, here, Hauf is the flesh, and then Sekru is a stative of the verb to overlay. Inui fi, with that fi rather than f for a dual, em hespedu ma'a. His eyebrows were made of pure or true lapis. Which is an interesting detail to include. Uh, it both has theological significance and also it's kind of weird to think about the eyebrows on a snake. Arek su er hanet. He was bent up in front. That is to say, he was reared up like a cobra. Uh, he kind of curled with his head forward, uh, which is what a snake does when it has stopped moving and is inspecting you especially a giant snake that wants to know more about this traveler. He opened his mouth to me. I started talking. I think this one probably has to be a circumstantial clause because it's just describing what's going on when he opens his mouth, which is while I was on my belly before him. Uh, in other words, giant snake shows up and the sailor just hits the dirt. He is fully prostrate, trying to just do whatever it takes to not get eaten by the giant snake. Because to be fair, it's a 45 foot long snake. I would be terrified too. I imagine unless you're a really big snake appreciator, anybody in the audience probably would be scared by this giant snake. So now we get to the literary devices, and the first one I want to point out is something called parallelism. Because parallelism is a, a literary trope that is really characteristic, I mean almost diagnostic, of ancient Near Eastern literary works, particularly of poetry and you know, similar traditional or similar traditions. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go into like something like the pyramid texts won't always have parallelism. Um, I mean, some, but it's not quite as obligatory as in, say, the Hebrew Bible's Psalms, which have tons of that. And while the, the shipwreck sailor uh, isn't quite poetic, it is being a literary tale in the same universe and therefore very much draws on this idea of parallelism, as we'll see a lot. The idea in parallelism is that you have two lines, and line B is like a repeat of line A, thematically, and oftentimes also grammatically, and like structurally, but with a few differences that both highlight the theme and show the range at which it is true. So, if you are Christian or Jewish, you probably know the 23rd Psalm. Uh, it is a very common one in the English-speaking world. Uh, so there's a famous line, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. And here the parallelism is in the, the uh, comparison between the green pastures and the still waters, these two very pleasant places to be. Uh, the fact that the actor is the same, it is, in both cases it is, it is you know, God who is telling you that you need, or is ma making you or leading you to these pleasant places. Uh, so the structure is very similar, and it is expressing similar concepts twice in order so that they can mutually reinforce one another. 
we get some parallelism that is, I think, just glaringly obvious and right on the surface. Frankly, a lot of it all throughout the Shipwreck Sailor. Uh, but the the big ones uh, in this air, like particular passage that just are pretty much repeating almost the same exact line right after each other. The, the trees shook, the earth trembled. That's the same line almost. It's the same event being expressed twice to emphasize all that it is going on and to you know, just kind of show off the parallelism. Uh, and then again, when in the description of the snake, you get the... Uh, you get the length of the snake, you get the length of the beard. You get the flesh is gold, the eyebrows are lapis. Not the beard, that is a that is a typo. It is the eyebrows that are supposed to be lapis. Um, and if you go to other sections of the Shipwreck Sailor, you'll see this a lot. Uh, I think you could probably analyze his listing of food in the same way, where he just goes on and on about all the kinds of food he finds in this island. That's also got some good examples of parallels in, in it, where two lines will contain very similar kinds of food to, you know, to perform this kind of literary trope. There's also, though, some, some deeper and more structural parallelisms within the text that are touching on this same idea of repeating the same thing multiple times to emphasize the deeper meanings and the range of meanings that is possible there. Uh, the big one in this particular text, or at least this section of the text, because there are other examples like this that would require you to know other chapters of this story. Um, but the big one here is the sailor finds something amazing and then he performs obeisance. You know, he is uh, making some kind of show of humility in the face of how amazing it is. First, he finds this beautiful, abundant food, just like it had been cultivated. Then, in thanks, he makes an offering of some of it to the gods, which is the thing that you do to give thanks for good fortune. And then he hears and then sees this giant snake, and in order to properly respect this beautiful and amazing creature, he bows down before it. He, he lies on his face, on his belly, in prostration in order to honor it. And this is... These are the same basic activity. Now, you know, one is the thing you do when you are giving thanks to the divine. The other is the thing that you do when you are in the presence of the divine. But in both cases, the, a miracle takes place. And then, in whatever form is most appropriate at that time, thanks are given. The ancients would have been very aware and clued into the fact that this is the same sequence of events with different you know, some changes, uh, the nature of the miracle, the nature of the obeisance offered, but this, the broader set of actions is being repeated, thereby establishing a parallelism, not between direct lines, but rather between whole sections of the text. There's also, I think in this section in particular, and also in, in some others, but here in particular, playing with sentence length has worked really well to create the correct sense of urgency in the narration. Uh, this is something, this is not just an ancient Near East thing. There is quite a bit of use of this in literature of all sorts. Uh, once you're clued into this, seriously read, read stuff, especially by very famous authors, you'll see it a lot, um, where the short sentences can really convey fast, urgent action. The trees shook, the earth quaked. Those sentences were three words long because they were sudden and they were scary. There was no unnecessary detail. It was just going right through. In the preceding section, when he's going out and finding all the food, it is a long list. It's just naming all the stuff because he is taking a leisurely walk down the beach, gathering up all the delicious food that he can eat. That's you know, a slow and relaxing activity, whereas the approach of the snake is scary, and the sentences get kind of shorter, especially as the snake like is immediately arriving, and when he uncovers his face, uh, and that I think really get gets at you know the the different emotional moods that the narrator, the the sailor, is in during that time. Uh, there's also, I think, something to be said about how much of the text is spent on particular areas. And, I mean, there's some readings of this that's like, well, you know, it's just what needs to be practiced by the scribes. And yeah, sure, there's, there's an extent to which this is a pragmatic text. But I think we can also read a lot of that as being 
descriptive of our protagonist. Because remember, we're not actually in the main story being narrated by some objective narrator. We are in a sub-story. We are listening to a sailor tell a story from his own life. The stuff the sailor talks about, he says because he thinks it was important. The stuff the sailor did not talk about, he does not say for also for a particular reason. For example, when the earth is shaking and all this, we don't hear what happens until the sailor recovers his senses. He's terrified, he's running on total instinct, and he can't remember what happens afterwards. You know, you're shooting with adrenaline, you can barely remember what's going on. This is a thing that happens. And then when he is calmed down, the earth is stopped, he, the first thing he remembers is that he uncovered his face. He doesn't remember covering it. He just remembers uncovering it. And I think that's actually a deliberate choice by the author to point out that he has his fear because he didn't remember everything that was happening to him. Again, we hear a lot about the snake's form. It would be sufficient to say it was a 45 foot long snake clad in gold, but we need to know the length of its beard and the color of its eye and the stones out of which its eyebrows are made and all this because the sailor is in awe of the snake. You know, he is face to face with this creature, clearly of another world, uh, a divine or semi-divine being that has appeared in front of him and he's just staring in awe. Fear, awe, and reverence, but awe. And that's why he, he spends so much time describing it because it burned such a clear image into his mind and he could recall in exacting detail everything about it. You can also read this text in terms of its cultural context. So, for example, that unique snake body, the eyebrows of lapis, the skin of gold, those are divine characteristics. Reading the text on its own, absent the cultural context or any relationship with any other text, which is what intertext means, it's hard to figure out why that would be true, why a snake would have these very weird body parts, but if you look at it within other texts, religious texts in particular, or within the material culture of ancient Egypt, you can see that it's characteristic of the divine. Uh, think about Tutankhamun's mask, the gold skin, the makeup, and in particular things like eyebrows and other detailing work, all done in bright blue in lapis, because that's what gods are supposed to look like, and the pharaoh after death is trying to be transformed and united with the divine. So, appropriately, the death masks are made to look divine in nature, uh, and the snake is given the same appearance. Again, the beard fills a similar role. Mortal Egyptians were generally clean-shaven, but the specific long central beard is a characteristic of divine beings of the king in certain ritual contexts, and of some gods who almost always had beards, gods like Ta, who, that's just how they're depicted because it is a divine attribute, it is a thing that a god might have. So by putting a beard on the snake, it not only references that this is clearly not a natural real world snake, because snakes don't have facial hair, but also that it is specifically a divine one, because it has characteristics most commonly associated with the divine. Then, of course, we can use this text or this section of text to attack the bigger themes of the work. In my opinion, which is not the only opinion and is not exhaustive, the two biggest and most important themes throughout the text are homesickness and trust in the divine. You think about it, this makes some sense, uh, because in the initial kind of frame story, the big conflict is that the, the captain is worried that he will, you know, the bad things will happen when he comes home, and he has no faith that things will be any better. But the opposite of that would be to be happy to be home, to be homesick and desiring a return, and to have one's faith in the gods that things will all work out well. The beginning and end of the story focus more on the homesickness side. And right now, on the, the island part, is a lot about the trust in the divine beings. And we get that really on full display. The sacrifices, the bowing, the stuff that characterizes the sailor is his immediate willingness and total commitment to participating 
in the necessary activities for the appeasement of the gods. He believes in the gods, he is a pious man, and he is doing what is necessary to keep them happy, bowing before their presences, offering them food, and all that. In fact, part of me wonders if it was deliberate that this is why he was spared and not the other crew members. The other crew members were very brave and believed they had foresight, but it was this sailor, this very pious sailor apparently, who was spared in spite of the disaster. That, I think, is perhaps one of the currents running under the whole work. Now, I am not an expert on the themes in The Shipwrecked Sailor. More serious literature has been written about this. This is simply my reading of it, rather than, you know, this is, I would have done a bit more with this if I were going to present it at a conference, but this is meant to just be kind of the, the introductory material on what this stuff might be. This is all subjective. Uh, it is particularly subjective coming from me. If you picked up on things in this reading that I didn't, or things in other sections of the Shipwreck Sailor that you think are interesting, or you think some of the stuff I said was wrong, I would love to hear what you have to say. Uh, but the purpose of this really is just to provide you with a set of angles that run through the text, some of which are applicable to other different texts as well, uh, that can help you read and understand what the author was getting at, kind of get in your mind what the Egyptians might have been saying in addition to just the literal words on the page. Because like every culture, Egyptian literature and storytelling in general is rife with inner meanings as well as the outer meaning. That's just a feature of how humans tell stories. We don't just tell them to say stuff, we tell them to make broader points about the world, and this is the, the means by which we get at those points. So I encourage you, one, to read Egyptian literature. It's great, it's really interesting. Uh, read it in translation if you can't deal with the Egyptian, but if you can, it's also just great practice for your Egyptian work. Read as much of it as you can in the original perhaps with the translation by your side to correct your work, but read as much as you can in the original because it will, it will help, so especially things like line length and section length that are meaningful and only really show up in the original Egyptian. So yes, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed going through this. Uh, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, and if, especially if anybody has any cool and interesting thematic ideas that they think I did not pick up on, please tell me. I am always happy to, to see other people's perspective on texts that I like. Thank you.